podcast where we focus on helping you claim what's rightfully yours, your health, and your freedom. We explore the three main areas of health, the physical realm, the biochemical realm, and the mental and emotional realm. We also explore all the areas of lifestyle we can find that will help you live more abundantly, regardless of where you're starting. And remember, in life, you'll either make excuses or create results. You choose. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Hant, and I'm glad to be with you here today. Make sure to head on down to the show notes and click on the link to join our tribe of human-powered life heroes, where we'll update you on new shows, events, product launches, and so much more. Now, it's time to enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Human Power Life Podcast. We have an awesome guest today. We have like a superhero to me, um, definitely a superhero in the running world, but you're gonna learn so much about this guy. His name is Dean Karnazes. If you have not heard of him, I don't know where you've been if you're a runner, and if you're new to him, you're gonna love this guy. And what I'm gonna do, which I don't do on any episodes, but he typed out a bio, which you know I have on a Google form, form and I'm gonna read this, and I think this is just, it'll give you an idea of who he is as a human being and more. So he's a best-selling author. He has many books and one time one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people on earth. How about that? It's pretty insane, right? Uh he has raced and traveled to all seven continents twice, including running across Death Valley in the middle of the summer, which is hot as hell, the hottest place on earth, and running a marathon to the South Pole, which is the coldest place on earth. Imagine you did that in, you know, a couple two days back to back, right? He serves as a U.S. athlete ambassador, has twice carried the Olympic torch, which is amazing, and is a recipient of the President's Council on Sports, Fitness, Nutrition, and Nutrition Lifetime Achievement Award. So there's one other thing I, I asked Dean to fill out, and I mean, there's a bunch of different things, but this is one other one I want to do. And uh, he's, I said, why do you do what you do? And I l- absolutely love this answer. It says, I don't know. It's really hard to make a living doing this shit, but I love it. So maybe that's why. And you definitely have a passion for running. You have a passion for being very human. As I saw you, I think you're starting a new business, uh, some tours in Greece. Uh, but Dean, welcome to the show. Thank you for that uh, gracious introduction. I, I'm not worthy. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> you are. And I love I love the humbleness of of people like yourself that I get to meet. Um, which makes you more real and and very, very powerful. So I guess where we could start is um, people have heard about the Badwater Marathon. People have heard about these crazy races uh, that you've done, that I've interviewed others that have done. And it's just astonishing to me. And I think it, it, it opens up people's eyes. But I want to connect people with you as a human being, not just the runner, right? Because that's what makes you so powerful and so influential, to the people you don't even know you're touching. Like obviously reading the book, he's got a great book, everybody. It's called The Runner's High. This is the newest one. And whether you're a runner or not, I think this book is so, so powerful. So jump into this with me a little bit, Dean, into the book, because I think this is where I want to bring people is really to get this book um, and experience you as a human being. So what made you want to start another? I mean, you have what four or five books. I've got I had on the website there, but a bunch of books. Yeah, well, I mean, I think running and writing are similar. It's uh, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. So I think that <laughs> every runner can relate to uh, how tough it is to, to complete a 100-mile race, and every author can relate to how tough it is to, to, to write a book. Uh, but I, I enjoy it, and, you know, I'm a natural storyteller. Uh, I'm 100% Greek, you know, I started with Homer, I guess, in the Odyssey. But I, I, you know, people are surprised when they read my books that I guess they don't suck. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> you know, they, 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 a lot of, you know, they, and I don't use a ghostwriter either. I, I, I write all the, my books myself and I put a lot of effort into it so that it, it, it flows. You know, it's um, a propulsive, it's a, it's a good narrative that keeps you kind of engaged. And I think that uh, it leaves you satisfied. I think if you're a runner, not a runner, um, when you get to the end, uh, you kind of feel like you got a little high, like a runner's high, and, and good yeah. writing can do that, and a good run can do that. Yeah, so uh, let's dive into the book a little, a little bit deeper, uh, just to give a little context, everybody. Um, Dean has been doing this for a long time. He's like the OG 
right? The, the original gangster of ultra marathon running. And if you read ultra marathon, man, you know, this guy would, would run, I think it was like something like 200 miles eat, ordering pizza to show up at his position on the, on the street or eating a cheesecake. Um, so he's done some really cool, crazy things, but there is this one race, which now has become like the, the Mecca of ultra marathoning around the world that I believe is the Western States. And the book dives into this journey is, you know, you did this more than a decade ago where I, I don't forget what you said, but there are not many people. This is like a small event. And now it's, I mean, the waiting list to get in, even for someone like yourself, where, you know, if you, I mentioned your name to a runner, they go, holy cow, that guy's crazy. So bring us into the journey. Um, Cause I want people to get the book, but bring us to the journey of like, what was the desire after 50? Like, you know, I want to do this crazy race one more time. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I first, um, my first ultra marathon was in 1993. And I don't, I, when were you born? I was born in 1979. <laughs> so a couple years before you were, after you were born, I, I ran an ultra marathon. And, you know, the first time I heard about someone running a hundred mile foot race, I thought, that's impossible. Like there's gotta be trickery involved. Like a human being cannot run a hundred continuous miles, let alone through the mountains. Uh, I thought there were campgrounds or hotels you stayed yeah. at. And when this guy said, no, the gun goes off and you start running and you try to finish within 24 hours. And I said, well, where do you sleep? And he looks at me like, <laughs> sleep. So I thought that is the most outrageous, impossible thing I've ever heard of. I got to try it. So I went and did this race called the Western States 100 Mile Endurance Run, which originally was a, a horse race. And some crazy guy whose horse uh, went lame is the, the legend. He just decided he was going to run the race without a horse, and he somehow finished. So uh, there's a lot of lore around the race. You know, the the first year I did it, I think it was like 50, 50 odds of getting in on the lottery because it's they limit the number of people that mm -hmm. can run the race. And now it's, you know, it's tougher to get into Western states than to get into Harvard. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's crazy, the number of people that want to run that race. Yeah. And I bet the percentage of people that finish that race are not super high either, I'd imagine. Well, it, it's changed. Okay. Uh, when I first started, it was uh, fewer people, you know, fewer percentage finished. But I think now it's it's not even necessarily that the, the runners are um, better equipped, but because it's so hard to get into Western states, you you know, and you might not ever get in again you're going to really take it seriously. You're okay, fair enough. And it's going to take, you know, uh, an act of Congress to get you to, to, to drop out because you work so hard to get in, you know, unless, unless you're going to end up in the hospital, you're going yeah. to keep going. So, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, and it's changed a lot. I mean, the, the race, when I first did it, I spent a lot of time out there running by myself. Uh, I didn't have a pacer. I didn't even know what I was doing. You know, just in the middle of the night, my batteries are running on my flashlight and this and that. You know, nowadays, you know, you, you're running with other people. It's, it's much more of a community event now, a much yeah. bigger in scale. Yeah. And I just I, don't quote me on this, but I believe the first guy that finished with the lame horse, I believe he was a chiropractor. He was. Gorgeous. He was, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I thought that was funny. I'm like, huh, I, would, I wonder if I can get into this race. But you said, like, getting into Harvard is easier than getting into this race. I've never applied for it. I may one of these years. Um, but I, I'd like to ask you this, you know, you've done a countless of countless thousands and th tens of maybe tens of thousands, not more miles on your feet, right? You're still standing. You're probably even standing right now as we're talking, right? <laughs> <You can laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So what are some of like the, the biggest, most impactful lessons you've learned, whether it's with family, with, anything this it doesn't make a difference through running because i think this is uh it, running has become such a crazy gift for me over the since 2017 i never thought i would run more than a marathon and you know i've run a lot more and i for me it's a, like almost like a spiritual meditative journey where i get lots of insight but I, what like what have you learned i think that you know running is worthwhile in itself mm -hmm. if you make running play and you can enjoy the act of running uh that you're gonna in, you're gonna keep running 
Uh, for me, you know, I always used to preach to people, uh, you know, I, I, running is therapy. I know a lot of people that have used running to overcome PTSD, depression, this and that. Uh, it was, those were kind of hollow words until the pandemic hit. Mm. And for me, it was devastating because all of a sudden my whole livelihood was shut down. I mean, I couldn't travel. I couldn't go to events. And I went into a funk that was pretty deep. And running saved me. <laughs> yeah. And to this very day, I know that if I'm in a funk, if I go running, it's going to change. And mm. so I think that what I've learned over the course of three decades of doing this is it all starts with our physical body. So much of our physical health determines our mindset. So prioritize physical health over, over anything else. And, you know, if, if, if you don't have your physical health, uh, then nothing else really matters. Yeah, that's powerful. And I just want to, you have these really cool, I'll call them quotes. They're like in the beginning of each chapter of the book. And <laughs> I get a question, like you said, like people like, or like you ask, like, where do you sleep during a hundred mile run? Like what happens? And and I get these questions from my patients in practice all the time when they like, wait, you run these crazy things. I've heard about that. But one of these quotes that you put, it's just chapter one. You know, the, the chapter is called Endurance Never Sleeps, but I love it. It says running an ultra is very simple or is simple. All you need to do is not stop, you know, and, and how, how much is that like life? And I like some of these little quotes, I was snapping pictures and sharing them on social media as I was going through this book and people like, what are you reading? This is so like bizarre, but it's so true. I go, it's a book called The Runner's High. Um, uh, so I, I don't even know where to go because I'm just, I'm so excited. I want to bring like with the business side of your running. You're writing about it. And now we just started this, or you just started this thing called Greek running tours. Like what was, I know you're Greek, 100% Greek. What was the drive to start that that world? Well, you know, running is a very diverse sport. Uh, you know, the, if you look at me compared to like a, an Olympic sprinter, we're both runners, but very different, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what, what I do and what they do is, is so entirely different. Uh, not everyone likes to run races. I mean, you see all these medals behind me of these marathons, and, you know, 100 milers and so forth. A lot of people just like to run to see places. And I know that when I travel, when I go to a new city, I typically explore on foot. So this kind of um, foot tourism uh, demographic is growing. And I thought, you know, I, I'm Greek and I love Greece and the running in Greece and the food in Greece and everything else is just incredible. So I thought, why not bring people to, to Greece to explore on foot? And, you know, if you're a runner to try to figure out where the best places to go, you know, to see things, to see the sites, to, to sample the foods, to have cultural experiences, that's not easy information to gather, let alone put together a route that links all these things. So that's what I designed. It's just these these eight day tours. Uh, and these it's are so not cool. races. I mean, these are, these are casual, you know, runs with a lot of breaks in between to, you know, like look at the Acropolis to, you know, to, we run one day up into the mountains of Crete uh, to this village where a woman has this kitchen where she makes bread. That is amazing. So we'll make bread one day. Oh, that's uh, so cool. Yeah. You know, the, the hotels are luxury hotels or massage services at night. So the running is just an excuse to, to eat great, great food and, uh, you know, enjoy the luxuries. That that's so cool. Um, I mean, so many islands, obviously in Greece, what are, what are some of like the favorite or is there a specific Island? Or are you kind of bouncing around as you do this? Yeah, no, uh, we have three, three tours. Uh, one is on mainland Greece, uh, in Athens and goes to the place called Mar Marathon <clears throat> is actually a place in Greece. People don't realize, but it's a little township mm -hmm. on the coast, uh, in, in Greece. So we go to Marathon, uh, we go to a nearby Island called Idra. Uh, which is, we say here in the U.S., Hydra, which is, you know, the, the island of water. And that island is incredible. There's no, no cars are allowed on the island. So it's all natural foot tourism. Yeah. There's no vehicles. Yeah. And then uh, we have a tour on Crete, uh, which is the largest uh, island in the Mediterranean. And then we have a tour uh, in mainland Greece that goes to also ancient Olympia. So you can run where the um, original Olympics were founded in uh, 776 BC. Hey, we're giving you a short break here. 
where you can head down to the show notes or lifestylelocker.com and join our tribe of human-powered life heroes. You'll be the first to know about new shows, events, product launches, affiliate specials, and more. And now, back to the show. Oh, that's so cool. I mean, it's, I mean, way to bring culture, travel. Uh, I mean, and obviously the food outside of the U.S. is so much better. And I, I, I've never been to Greece, but I can only imagine eating olives and homemade bread and all the things that they were doing maybe during the Olympics, right? The original uh, would be such like, I probably have to put this on my list of to do's. Um, and do you do all of them yourself? Are you, are you the guide? No, I'm I'm going to be at all the tours, but um, I we actually have guides. Uh, okay, they're, of mine. they're they're Greeks that are a friend of mine that speak English. Okay, they're going to be the tour guides. Uh, you know, we'll run together as a group, so we limit the group size to to twenty four, mm-hmm. uh, so it's kind of intimate. But we'll we'll hang together as as a group, so we'll get a lot of interaction with the other participants as well as the guide. Yeah, and I think that this is such a cool thing to do post being locked down. And I mean, being with community is just, it's much happier. You know, I know that we get to do this via zoom, but I would love to have been at your place or been out for a run and had a, a recorder to do this. I think it, you know, we could have a lot of fun. Um, so besides the running, you know, in your book, something that I directly connected with is uh, your connection to family. And I think that is so powerful. Um, is this something like your connection to your, you know, your parents, your, your kids, your wife, is there, was this something you were brought up with? Because this, you know, I don't get to hear this a lot from people when they're talking, writing in a book, talk about family. If you're a runner, it's about running, you know? So, but this is really like a, a self-help book, if you will. Yeah. I mean, you know, running uh, is kind of polarizing in that it, uh, it brings people together or it kind of tears people apart. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, when you're in a relationship and one partner starts, you know, spending six, seven hours a day training <laughs> that, you know, your partner's either going to love it or hate it. And thankfully running brought my family together. And I think any good story, I mean, if you look at good storytelling, there's, there's always uh, a family involved. There's always family dynamics. I mean, going back to Homer, you know, Odysseus the whole time was trying to get back to his family. So, you know, uh, involving my family and thankfully my family is kind of a colorful cast of characters uh i think it just it 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 makes the book more than something just about running because you know how long can you talk about just running yeah well this is true this is true but people do (laughs) people (laughs) definitely do um no you know in the book in the runner's high you know i love just as you're in this western states run and and your parents and the camp, right? It's just so cool. Like, I wish I could have been like a fly on the wall through this journey. And I, you, uh, to your credit, you write really, really well. Like, I didn't want to put the book down. It was a book that I was able to like, literally just like the ultra marathon, man, this book was another one. I was like, it was a page turner. Um, Cause there are many books that I pick up that I don't want to pick up again. I could say that <laughs> very true. So I applaud you on that. Um, is there any other like really big, I know we mentioned the life lessons already. Um, anything that I was looking at the book cover here, you weren't, you mentioned like being polarizing. Do you feel that running has brings more people together? Because I see like running is like a community of like, you know, you can have people that are any color, any weight, any size, anything, and everybody just comes together. Is there something, is there a positive, uh, more positive you think in running than negative with this? We talk about being polarized. Yeah, I mean, when I say polarizing, it's usually um, a relationship. But okay, in general, I think you know. I mean, I've run around the world, and I talk about some of this. You know, the the runs I've done in different parts of the world in the book mm-hmm. unites people. You know, there's so many things in this world that divide us. You know, be it uh, the color of our skin, you know, the god we worship, our socioeconomic level. You know, here in the U.S., our politics. But when we run, it's a commonality that we share as a species and it unites us. So it's the, the one thing that really brings us together. And I see that with running and I see the delight on people's faces when they see a runner. I mean, you know, I'm running down a road in Uzbekistan, you know, and a car will pass and you'll just get a quick glimpse with the driver and you'll connect. You'll see they're smiling. I don't know what it is about running. They kind of just, I don't know. It, it, it kind of unites people in a way. And 
there's this term in Buddhism called metta, and it's the the empathy you feel for someone who's suffering. Mm. So, uh, you know, like if you see someone at, a, you know, if you spectate at a marathon and you see these runners going by, you feel a connection with them and their struggles. So, I don't know, there's something inherent about running that just, you know, it, it transcends borders and, and all those other things I talked about. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's so true. And in, in conversations that I have, people think, does, does everybody look like you at these crazy ultra marathons you do? And it's, I'm like, listen, is every shape, size, you can never judge a person. My first hundred mile attempt I did, there was a military guy who was probably five foot five. I guess he was out on disability. He was probably about 250 pounds. He was a big guy. And I was talking to him. It was my first, first one. I'm nervous. And he's, I go to him, I go, Hey, uh, you know, like, have you done this before? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I've done, I've done. It was like whatever week it was in the year. He's like, I've done like 4,200 miles, this hundred mile races this year alone. I'm like, what? Like you would never, if you looked at him, you, the, being a judgmental human being, as many of us are, I was like, holy cow, I want to listen to this guy. Not necessarily the, the person that's flying by me, you know, Mach one. I'm like, this guy knows what he's doing. If he can do this every single week of the year for the whole year. Um, so yeah, I agree. It's, it's so powerful and in uniting that, that brings every type of human being together. Like you said, it transcends politics and all of the BS of the world, which makes it a happy place. Right. Yeah. I, I, and, you know, you go to an ultra marathon and it's you, the other thing that um, to me is really unique is that you have conversations with people mm -hmm. uh, that you never really would really connect with. I mean, you know, I connect with younger people and older people and you mm -hmm. know, people of different nationalities while you're running and you might run together for an hour or two and you have really great conversations. And yeah, it was the last time like you sat down with some guy you know, like at a coffee shop for two hours and a stranger and had a really meaningful conversation. It just doesn't happen. No. If you're out there running and, you know, you hook up with someone like that, you form some really deep bonds. And I, I've seen this all. It's kind of a universal thing. Yeah. And uh, you may experience it or have experienced it or still do. For me, there's a lot of connection in, in and I hate to sound terrible, but in the suffering of like an endurance run. And because you're sharing, like everybody's sharing the same thing. So that, that connection for me, and I, and I do rucking as well um, with one of my friends in the military. And we, we did one the other day and it was pouring rain. It was windy. It was miserable. And I'm like, we're going to go out, Mike. He's like, yeah, he goes, this is just <laughs> going to build better, a better relationship and make us a little bit tougher. And it's true. It's, I think there's something in human nature, you know, before all of our comforts in this world that, that, discomfort brought people together. I mean, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, shared suffering does bring people together. And, you know, there's there's a quote from my first book, um, you know, there's magic and misery. Mm. And I think that, you know, so, so much of the life we've designed in Western culture uh, removes us from misery, right? I mean, we try to take a pill if we have pain you know, you, you watch television and half the, the ads are for pharmaceuticals that, you know, help you stop your, your hurting. Yeah. Where a runner, you know, or anyone rucking, you know, we welcome that. We, we see pain as just as part of, of life and we embrace it. And, you know, I think if you're comfortable uh, when you're in pain, it helps with every element of your life. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you 100%. And would you also say, uh, in your running career, um, you know, egos can, I think can be pretty big, maybe at your, your level where you are, not where I am, but I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, a low level ultra marathoner. Um, do you feel at that level in ultra marathon that there, there are a lot of big egos or at that level, there is like an even playing field with people just good. I don't know. I think that, you know, I, running is very humbling sport by nature. And I think that, uh, you know, if you get too full of yourself, <laughs> just one DNF will bring you back, uh, back down to size. So mm. I tend to think that people, uh, that run have somewhat of a diminishment of ego. Okay. When, when we're actually running, I, I've seen this over and over again, people soften uh, their egos, I should say, you know, when you get beat up, 
uh, you're you're less concerned about your ego, and more just focusing on mere survival, just being in the here and now, and just taking the next step to the best of your ability. And I really like that. I mean, I think that to me, uh, to suppress my ego, even if I have to go do it physically, uh, is is really a good thing. I mean, I I I try to you know manage my ego as much as possible, and and you know sometimes uh, just exhausting yourself physically does a really good job of that that's so cool that's so cool yeah it's uh it's such an interesting sport and you know i you know watching any kind of pro pro sport it's it's all ego and i think you're you're so right with running is probably the suffering creates humbleness and the humbleness creates connection with with more of us uh as as just human beings and um one last thing I want to just talk about, just simple something with nutrition. I know I'm just making a hard turn here and I'm not sure if this has been true in the past. You know, my first, one of my first events, ultra events I did, like the hundred mile events I did. Um, when I show up to the aid station, there was, you know, the side that was filled with Skittles, Coca-Cola, all of the junk. And then there was a side that had like broccoli, you know, and carrots. And it was so weird. I was the one guy going, I'm like, why am I the only human being on this side that has like the vegetables and the soup and stuff? And everybody's just like gorging. Has that been forever in the ultra world that way? You know, aid station food is it, always been a hodgepodge for as long as I can remember. I mean, I mean uh, the potatoes, mm -hmm. you know, the, the boiled potatoes with the sea salt, you know, yeah. dip them in, the chicken broth. And then, you know, that the Doritos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, in my first book, Ultra Marathon, man, I kept a log of the food I ate during a 200 mile run. And most of it was just junk food I was getting, you know, at 7 Eleven as I was running past. Mm. Uh, so it wasn't a lot of healthy stuff. Um, but that's changing. I mean, I think that, you know, over, over the course of my career as an ultra marathoner, uh, you know, the veganism's become a big thing you know the paleo diet you know i've been kind of paleo most of my life but that's kind of become a thing and then there's people on you know keto that uh, only want to eat you know coke raw coconut when they get to an aid station uh, so it's 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 a pretty it's an interesting hot part of food yeah and and i, I know this is because running is a we'll call it like a fitness-based event like you talk about taking care of your body is the primary function um do you see a trend you know, in, in the running world where there, uh, you mentioned like veganism and, and paleo, even at races or do the, oh, I'm trying to say, how do I say this? Do the direct race directors, do you think it's just, you know, we're just going to make people happy or do we're going to like, Hey, listen, we want these people to perform well. Yeah. <laughs> good question. I mean, I, I, you know, some, some of the, um, ultra marathons you know they have people actually making like quesadillas and things like that and that yeah. food, you know warm food on a cold night is is like from heaven so i think that um uh, you know race directors uh typically are going to cater to people's needs mm. but i think that uh you know i've, I've seen vegans you know, grab pieces of beef jerky <laughs> 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 something salty and chewy and like oh i've had enough you know, mash yams for, <laughs> for a while. I'm going to gnaw on some jerky. Yeah. So then let's just finish up with this, Dean. Um, out of all of your running adventures, not even races, just your running adventures. I know this, you have the Silk Road, you have all these really cool stories from around the world. What has been one of your most favorite adventures you've been on, you know, being human powered? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, uh, I described this event in, in the book as um, running into the White House. Mm -hmm. So I was running across America and I got a call from um, the White House saying that there was someone there that wanted to meet me, someone by the name of Michelle. <laughs> and I thought it was a prank call. But, as, you know, as I'm running down Pennsylvania Avenue, the, the gate to the White House opens and they wave me in. And I literally run into the White House and run down the hallway of the White House. I'm literally running, you know, in my running gear. Yeah. yeah this red carpet, you know, with presidential bus on either side. And, and, and there waiting for me was Michelle Obama. That's um, wild. Yeah. It, it was crazy. Yeah. 
So that's, uh, yeah, that's, you know, and that's pretty cool that you say that, like running into a building, if you will, like you've run across Antarctica, the, the, you know, the hottest place and the coldest place on earth and Silk Road and running to the White House. I think that's so, so cool because there's so much history for this country in there. Um, and, and everybody, I want to make sure you head over. If you don't follow Dean on Instagram, there's so much, he's got such great content, such like such personal shares, which, which I love. Um, he got his new Greek running tours, Instagram as well. Head over to Ultra Marathon Man, which is his website. And I would recommend if you're starting somewhere, if you haven't read any of his books, that was my first. I kind of, you know, a thing with it. So definitely get the Ultra Marathon Man first, but the runner's high is such a page, fast page turner. Um, and you can see his evolution, obviously, as a, as a human and as a runner going from one book, the first book to the newest book. So, Dean, I want to thank you. This has been an absolute blast. Um, I, I hope at some point in my life I get to to run with you somewhere around the planet, maybe in Greece, who knows? Um, so I appreciate it. So thank you so much. Yeah, I look forward to that day. You've been great and um, best wishes to you. Best wishes to the audience as well. I hope uh, we can all share some footsteps together one day, preferably yeah. in Greece. Yeah, yeah, in Greece, right? Yeah. A marathon, it would be so cool. So Dean, again, thank you so much. And everybody, make sure you scroll down to the show notes. We'll connect all of the dots for you. Uh, so you can connect with Dean and he is uh, an inspiration for me. And I'm sure he'll be an inspiration for you if you just follow along the road. All right, y'all. See you later. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Human Powered Life Podcast. Make sure to head over to LifestyleLocker.com to check out all the details on the show and to watch part two of this episode, which is only in video format. We also have this audio portion in video format if you want. Once again, I'm your host, Dr. Josh Hant for the Human Powered Life Podcast, and I'm looking forward to staying connected with you as a human powered life hero. Remember to join the tribe, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.